take us back to, uh, as you mentioned, like being thrown in the deep end throughout your early on in your career, how important for practitioners listening in uh, is it, do you think to uh, yeah, be, have someone that does sort of take you out of your comfort zone in a safe yeah. way, of course. Yeah, very. And and even, you know, I do do um, supervision for placements for students and, and, and things. And I feel like they're still quite nervous to go out like they've had the training, but but to actually run the interventions, even take someone through a relaxation script or a meditation script. Um, he used to make us like we would run the groups and we would be the participants and we had to do all of that. And then each of us had to be the facilitator of the group and do all this practice. Um, so he really was into building the efficacy for us. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of the courses aren't run like that anymore, but I certainly do that for my supervisees is say, if you go, you know, give, us, give it your best shot, you're going to learn something. Um, yeah. But but the way to do it is actually do it. Applying <laughs> like it. Get, yeah, get practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of getting a foot in the door for... Um, as a, as a sports psychologist, how challenging is it early days while you're building your network base and your, and your skill set and I guess your reputation? How, how challenging can it be to get some experience in elite sport? Yeah, I think in Australia, quite, quite challenging because, um, you know, in, in a lot of other countries, it's, it's, it could be a full-time job. Um, it's, I think, probably more so with the increase in mental health problems in athletes that that's where psychs are now getting the roles in, in elite sport. Mm -hmm. But really, like, if unless you're aligned with an institute, um, you know, it, it's very unusual to get a full-time role. So that's why I always say to, to my students, you, you have to learn to generalise and have cl good clinical skills, um, not just be... A performance psychologist because you're not going to be able to get a, a role like that for developing listeners you, you mentioned uh how important it is to start practicing mental skills um when you're working with an athlete for the first time uh what what do you like to see in terms of how coachable someone is and and uh yeah how, how can you uh, what, what can young athletes take on do you think to make the most of um working on their mental skills and mental health literacy in terms of yeah. uh, their, their mindset when they're working on these skill sets? Yeah. I think I think they do have to be open to know that if they want to be elite, then they're going to need both. I, I always just say um, it's like the secret weapon. If you have the mental stuff, everyone's going to get the same training. They're going to get the same access to resources. The difference is there are people born that just arrive with these kind of what I call champion mentalities. You know, they're... They're mentally agile. They've got grit. They um, they have a thirst to to learn and grow. They're internally driven. They focus on their own mastery rather than you know where they should be in comparison to other people. Mm. Um, they just they they have a deep belief in themselves that they will get there. They just need to persist. These are the characteristics of some of the most successful people on the planet. For those who are listening in that um, want to strengthen their inner belief or strengthen their ability to, to compose under high pressure moments in a game, you mentioned the importance of, of practicing it in training for transference on game day performance. What, yes. what, would it, what would it look like? You don't have to name players, but what would a sort of yeah. process look like for, for some of the Richmond players when they're training during the week to help a specific area like the ones you mentioned the elite have? Yeah, so so I might be um, looking at, say, doing their breathing, like the diaphragm breathing, because that um, will help. It'll help them sleep the night before. It'll also reduce performance anxiety. Um, we know that if they're in the fight or flight response, if the game gets tense, that their blood goes away from their centre, moves into their extremities, that makes them more uncoordinated, so very stilted and tense. So it keeps them relaxed, which gives them a chance for the automatic physical training and motor learning to occur. So instead of just thinking, oh, you only use that when you actually feel anxious, mm. we would be getting them to train it, say, with set shot kicking, um, use it, practice it in between any breaks of play, quarter to quarter to reset, even, even just, um, you know, centre bounces while they're all walking back athletes listening in that want to start practicing um, and pairing it with their activities in life and at training what would be a simple method to follow yeah I think um let me think where you would start I, I I probably think the biggest thing is the awareness 
so what people tend to do is they worry about their mistakes. Mm. They worry about making mistakes because they want to be better. But but mistakes is completely expected, right? We, it, that's just the, the chance. You, you're doing something that you're learning. We, we expect mistakes. I would say the, the people who even, even when they're still playing, when they're 60 playing their sport and they love it, they, they're the ones who recover from their mistakes the quickest. Mm. So I'd say as young athletes, the, the first line would be, are you spending, you know, 50% of your concentration on that past mistake, which only leaves you 50% concentration on this present moment? Mm. And then they wonder why they get a roll of mistakes because they're actually not able to have 100% focus here and they can't tell me if I if it was a golfer's swing say or something like that if they got 50 back there and 50 here when I ask them what went wrong in your technique they can't tell me 